Hello and once again, welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe, where faith and reason intersect and ideas about the world collide. I'm Doug Keck with you. I'm your host, and I'm coming to you from our EWTN studios right in the heart of Irondale, Alabama, where Mother Angelica began everything way back when. And again, we're about a couple of weeks away from uh, honoring her, our one-year anniversary to the passing of our wonderful foundress, who uh, is the reason where you can sit here today and have this wonderful program with Father Spitzer talking about contemplation. And of course, remember, you're a big part of this program. Email us your questions at spitzersuniversityw10.com. You can also use the Facebook we have in facebook.com forward slash EWTN online hashtag FSUniverse. And as well, we check out Twitter, twitter.com forward slash EWTN hashtag FSUniverse. And for all things that relate to Father Spitzer, the one and only place is his website, Magicenter one word. Dot com And let's move quickly out to the West Coast and see Father Spitzer at the Christ Cathedral campus where our West Coast studios are and where we always get the uh, pleasure of uh, seeing him and talking to him about uh, wonderful things of the Catholic faith. And this week we're going to be talking about contemplation and what exactly that means. How are you doing, Father? I'm doing great, Doug. Thank you very much. So, uh, have you been con and, uh, con yes, contemplating this program, or uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yes, and anticipating it? Uh, what's the difference between anticipating <laughs> yes. something and contemplating something? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that's a great question to start <laughs> with because, uh, you know, contemplation has had so many definitions over the centuries. Right? Mm -hmm. The the Greeks actually thought contemplation was like a a high state of theorizing, right? The, they used to call theoria, mm -hmm. and uh, you know where you talk, you think about the the ultimates and metaphysics, and and you know first causes and ultimate meanings and so forth and so on. And and in a sense, you know that that you know contemplation does have that that sense to it, the mm -hmm. nous almost, you know, in, in in Greek, you know, and and of course also intellectus in in Latin can. Mean a variety of different things. It, you know, it can certainly be, you know, not just thinking about the important or highest things of life. It it could also be just withdrawing from the practical uh, concerns, right? You know, praxis, the day-to-day -day administrivia, and sort of just thinking about what I have to do, you know, or what you know maybe God is calling me mm -hmm. to, and sort of a uh, uh, you know a higher level. Uh, but when Christians talk about contemplation, uh, they they really don't talk about you know emptying themselves or you know thinking about you know uh, the the higher things of life or mm -hmm. ultimate meanings and so. Uh, what they really mean is uh, being in relationship with God, and and the contemplative act is oriented towards a relationship, uh, and and of course contemplation. Always go back. Always goes back to to action. Mm -hmm. So we are view ourselves as contemplatives in action. Even the mystics, right? The, the main difference between Christian mysticism and mysticism in other religions is that Christian mystics always return to the world. Mm -hmm. Christian, even Teresa of Avila, right? She's going to go and she's going to be the spiritual director of, and leader of her sisters, St. John of the Cross. All the great, uh, you know, mystics are always coming back, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to share their experience uh, with what is going on uh, in the world. So, the, but the idea, though, uh, is, yeah, contemplation is this relationship with God. And, it, and it's trying to get to a, a state where we can just be with the Lord, mm -hmm. in touch with the Lord, in almost an intuitive contact, uh, you know, with Him, where we know in our hearts His love and what that means, and you know, in all the sense that that means, right? Uh, you know, one Corinthians thirteen: love is patient, love is kind. So, you know, what does what's the Lord's gentle heartedness, and 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 you know, how to bring that back to the world? But we're we're almost on absorb, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. 
uh, with the Lord. We're uh, almost in that state where we are connecting with him mm -hmm. exceedingly deeply and empathetically, right? But you, you just don't start there, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that very, very deep connection, empathetic connection with the Lord where his whole essence begins to rub off on us, where we begin to know him mm -hmm. in our hearts and want to imitate his ways and want to imitate his being simply because we've been in touch with them, right? You know, that that's kind of uh, arriving mm -hmm. at, at a higher state of contemplation, but that's a, a kind of Christian ideal. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing to think about is, yes, there's this deep empathetic connection with God, uh, a deep appreciation, being almost awed by God, you know, uh, being beholding him, uh, not just appreciating him, but beholding him in, in a sense of awe and wonder and, and of course, uh, connecting him mm -hmm. with, with him in empathy as, as a friend and, and, and also as father, right? And, and in that deep connection relationship uh, with him, uh, like any friend, right? Uh, he begins to rub off on us. You, mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you hang around with somebody long enough, and all of a sudden you, you start taking on some of their mannerisms or some mm -hmm. of the, the, you know, the. Uh, if you admire them, if you love them, if you're in uh, wonder of them, you start becoming like them, mm -hmm. and and of course you be, your heart imitates their heart, and that's you know what uh, John Henry Newman meant by cor ad cor loquitur, mm -hmm. heart speaking to heart, mm -hmm. where it's an empathetic connection. There's a co-natural experience of the heart of the other person, and you just begin to identify with it. Uh, because you love it, you embrace it, you appreciate it, you behold it, you admire it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's that which is the ideal of contemplation. Mm -hmm. But as I said, we just don't get there, right? I mean, uh, Christian contemplation is, is utterly beautiful. It utterly goes back to the world, you know, from, from whence it came. Because we use, when we pick up, you know, God's heart, we want to bring it back to the world and share it with the people in the world. Who is this mm -hmm. Lord of love that has come to be with us? You know, share the heart of Christ that we've experienced, mm -hmm. not just the thought about, but who is this heart of uh, the Lord that we've experienced uh, and share it with them. So, so where do Christians start the contemplative life? Right, right. The main, th the main thing is you don't have to get fancy, right? But the first thing is use really common prayers and use the Psalms, right? Mm -hmm. So our objective in contemplation is to come into that wonder and beholding of the Lord, that, that you know, admiring Him, right? And, and where do you start, you know, this, this state of, of admiration, of awe, of wonder, of love, of connection, of empathy? Where do you start from? Well, hymns of praise are really good places to start with, right? Because when you love somebody, you know, and, and, and you appreciate or you're in awe, these psalms are just so beautiful. I mean, they, they you know, especially the, the nature, uh, you know, of them. So praise be God for the skies and the birds and the dolphins. And, you know, praise the Lord for, you know, the soul that he has given me, the soul that's able to contemplate him, the soul that's able to, to try and penetrate the mysteries of the world. Praise be to God for the freedom that I have, right? Praise be to God for, mm -hmm. you know, the, the history into which I'm born. Praise be to God for the inspiration, protection, and guidance that he gives me. So, you know, praising the Lord for, you know, his nature, right? So we can, you know, uh, the divine presence, right? Uh, uh, the divine praises, right? Blessed be God. Mm -hmm. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be okay. Jesus Christ, true God and true man, etc. These things, all of them, you know, praising the Lord is a place to start because when we mean that genuine praise, what we're saying is, Lord, we think you're beautiful. We absolutely know your love. We know that you love us. And of course, uh, you know, right. you've given us all these good gifts. They're so manifest. And of course, so giving praise is a huge thing. 
Second way to start the contemplative life is with the simple praise, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Ignatius calls the contemplation to attain love. It's just a, a gigantic prayer of thank of thanksgiving, right? So, it, it, you know, thank you, Lord, for all the things that you have given uh, to me, th to the people around me, to the friends, you know, the parents, the family I was given, to the gifts I've been given, to the work that I have, you know, to the ability to serve your kingdom, to you know, whatever it may mm -hmm. be, you know, to give God thanks and then give God thanks even for the mystery of his being, you know, for, you know, the, the, the wonder that he is and the creation uh, of the world around us. And so we can, you know, again, th that is, uh, you know, a way of starting contemplation. So, so when you praising God, when you say that, God. and, you know, I think of gratitude and I think of humility. So, I mean, is that part of it, that whole idea of, of dealing with one's own humility in, in order to com contemplate yes, God? I, uh, because you, you, at once, you know you are creature mm -hmm. and you also know you are beloved. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the particular uh, revelation of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, in, in all religions, right, all human beings, you know, know they are creature, God is creator. God is the mysterious, mm -hmm. incomprehensible, superseding one, and we are the, cr the creature that he has made that is, is doing the beholding and, uh, of the mystery. But in, in, in Christianity, we add the idea of we are beloved, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea, we're not just a creature. We are a beloved creature. We are a dearly beloved creature. We are an inestimably uh, dearly beloved uh, creature. Uh, God, of course, has utter desire, not just for mm -hmm. our salvation, but to be in relationship with us as we have a desire to be in relationship with Him. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this idea, you know, again, the beginning of the spiritual life is, is that kind of, you know, sensitivity mm -hmm. Uh, to our um, creatureliness and our belovedness, and, and of course, if you you, you got to be humble in order to have creature right. consciousness, as okay. Rudolf Otto would say, right? I mean, you can't, you know, be th <laughs> the minute you start thinking of yourself as God, there might be a right. humility problem there anyway. But uh, so the, the the key feature right. then is to, you want to begin ever and always right. by acknowledging, you know, the goodness of God. The, the beauty of God, the majesty of God, the wonder of God, and thanking God for all the gifts that, that, that we have been given. This is a stance of gratitude, which is of course a stance at once of humility, but it's also a stance of creatureliness, and it's also a stance of wonder mm. before the majesty of God, and a stance of awe before the majesty of God. And these things are the, the starting points mm -hmm. of this intimate, empathetic connection that we want with God so that when we are in relationship with Him, you know, we are, are basically enjoying Him. Very good. Uh, in a previous okay. episode, uh, I, I, I just want to say one thing. In a previous ep episode, I talked about the most important way to introduce your contemplative prayer. Uh, is to say, Lord, I know you are here and I know you love me. And, and, and that is absolutely key for, uh, you know, beginning contemplative prayers to acknowledge the presence of the Lord, to acknowledge his love for us, mm -hmm. and to express our love back in return to him. And then, of course, with hymns of praise, hymns of thanksgiving, hymns of joy or rejoicing, and so forth. So uh, okay. every common prayer can be turned into a contemplative prayer. Okay, let's uh, let's get to some questions here because uh, people uh, write sure. to us and we want to get to those. Right. Uh, while watching a recent episode, uh, I was contemplating six criterion that you recently discussed on how God answers our prayers. Please clarify how God's answer will not undermine others' salvation and will not determine others' freedom. God bless you, Francesca. Hey, Francesca, that's a really good question. You're right, those six criteria, uh, two of the criteria, well, first of all, of course, God's never going to undermine our salvation or do, relieve some suffering 
that, uh, that is uh, in some way helpful to our salvation. But remember, we touch the lives of others. And we touch the lives not just of family members, colleagues, but in all kinds of ways, we're touching people's lives. And sometimes our suffering, believe it or not, can have such a purifying and good effect on us that we actually can, in turn, help somebody else's salvation. So, uh, you know, God's not going to take away suffering that will help us help others to salvation. He's, you know, if, if God sees that our suffering can be a point of identification for somebody else who is suffering and they can look at how our faith influences uh, suffering and maybe those other people can then say, oh, you know, this is terrific, right? You know, I, I, I can do it. If, if, if Spitzer can do it, I can do it. He's not going to take those sufferings away because that would tend mm -hmm. to undermine a path to salvation and the Lord is going to literally allow uh, me to affect as many people's salvation as possible. And if suffering is a good route to doing it, and it frequently is, mm -hmm. because suffering really uh, through that vulnerability and weakness improves the quality of our actions. It totally improves the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the, the, way in, the way in which we mm -hmm. love or the way in which we manifest our faith, the dependence on God, it's going to affect the way we affect other salvation. So that's the, the, uh, the key idea. The, the second um, mm -hmm. question, part of your question was, well, how does this affect others? Uh, free, how, how is it that our suffering can affect others' freedom? Mm -hmm. uh, the point I was trying to make is, you know, God's not going to sit there and uh, interrupt the whole cycle of natural causation by causing a miracle every five seconds, right? So if we're suffering, uh, we're going uh, to we're going to try and find the opportunities in the suffering, follow the Holy Spirit through that suffering, right? That's going to be more beneficial to us than getting uh, probably a miracle uh, uh, instantly. At least mm -hmm. in in my case, thank God I didn't get a miracle. You know, the 101 times uh, you know uh, that I asked for it, I got it on the 102nd. Now the, the the you know and and the miracle was slight. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't a, a, a mega miracle, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the idea is, you know, if, we, if we're getting miracles, uh, you know, every five seconds, you know, again, that undermines other people's freedom, too, mm -hmm. because they go, well, you know, gee whiz, you know, why didn't I get a miracle? Or, right. hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, maybe, maybe I'll get a miracle as often as Spitzer's getting a miracle, and so forth and so on. So we've got all kinds of expectations that go outside of the natural order. But in order for you to know what's coming down the pike in the next five minutes, you have to know, uh, in, in some sense, what natural causation normally portends. And if you get a miracle every five seconds, you're mm -hmm. not going to have any idea, no. in which case you can't possibly be free. So God's not going to undermine uh, that capacity right. uh, of others' freedom through alleviation of your suffering, say, through a miracle. Okay, very good. Question number two. Father Spitzer, mm -hmm. I value your opinion, and I worship God as a Catholic. <coughs> And uh, what do you think of transcendental meditation and holistic therapy? Do you re recommend any and why or why not? Thank you, Ben. So I guess the first one, maybe we should think, take and kind of parse that into the transcendental meditation because when we talk about contemplation, sometimes we hear that. Sometimes there's a question in a church of something yep. that's called centering prayer that kind of gets mixed right. in with this. And maybe you could pull those apart for us. Yeah, as I said, Christian contemplation uh, is not a kind of meditation that has self in the center or even the annihilation of self in the center. So it, it, it generally is not a prayer where I am trying, I am trying in some sense to purge myself from something or purge self uh, from myself, or to purge something within myself, or even to just get free of life's concerns. I mean, th there are practices of transcendental meditation, yoga, and so forth and so on, that you know, kind of can free people 
uh, you know, from a, a lot of these concerns. But frankly, I don't recommend it because I think in Christian meditation, you've, you have a double thing that's going on. You're bringing your relationship with God into the process of freeing you from those life's concerns. We have something from the revelation of Jesus, a grace from the Holy Spirit, a grace from the Jesus who came to be incarnate with us that literally helps us to be free from those concerns. We don't have to do this ourselves. Why would we want to do it ourselves? Mm -hmm. Why would we want to get into what I call a disciplined structure of either self-abnegation or abnegation of desire, which is focused either on the self, abnegation of the desire by itself, or abnegation of the self? Why would I want to do that if I can go and be with God, my friend, the one who loves me, the one you know, that, that I, I, you know, admire, mm -hmm. I think, I love, and, and he can help me to have that peace and that freedom, which will allow me to, to get some distance from the concerns of today, which will allow my mind uh, to be clear so that I can think about his will. I don't want to think about great things. Mm -hmm. I want to think about great things in the context of his will. Uh, of being with him. He's the one that I want to be with. He is the source of all wisdom. He is the source, uh, you know, of, of, of all mystery. So for all intents and purposes, you know, it, it's like, you know, transcendental meditation, you know, it, you know, because it does not per se involve the loving God and his companionship with me, my my thanksgiving to him, my praise of him, my awe of him, and trying to allow him ever more deeply into my life to find my peace, because it does not operate that way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, to me, just second best. It's like fifth best. Hmm. You know, it's very partial. And there is a side problem with it as well. And that is the problem of self-deception mm -hmm. that's in it. When you're, you're using a contemplative practice that's oriented toward the self or self-abnegation, you are reliant on your own powers uh, to get there. And I can tell you this very fact. When I rely on my own powers, mm -hmm. this is not a good idea. For I can be deceived. I can actually be believe it or not, very selfish and have my own little agendas which somehow creep into my profound contemplations <laughs> and they get in there through what's called the unconscious mind mm -hmm. and do not for a second undervalue what's going on in the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to a third delimitation of the Transcendental Meditation practice and that is remember when you are intentionally turning off the conscious mind, you are literally creating a free road from the unconscious to your psyche. Mm -hmm. And all there's a lot of stuff in your unconscious mind. Good symbols, mm -hmm. bad symbols, horrid symbols, whatever. But when you create a free road without conscious blocks, for the unconscious to just kind of move in as if, you know, allowing dream world to come unmitigated into your psyche, you don't know what you're going to get in there. And, for, and don't think for a moment it, it won't happen that you'll have this, you know, truly great control over such things. It happens. It mm -hmm. absolutely happens. And so for all intents and purposes, I would just have to say, stick with Christian contemplation, you don't have to worry about the negative effects of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about the rationalization, self-deception that comes from a self-focused kind of meditation, even if it is for the abnegation of the self or for the denial of the mm -hmm. self. You know, it's still, <laughs> deception is everywhere present when you deal with the self by itself. Mm -hmm. And finally, of course, why wouldn't you want to, to find the peace you're striving for. Why wouldn't you want to find the detachment 
you're striving for, the clarity you're striving for with your best friend, with your companion, who is the source of all wisdom, the source of all love, and the source of all mystery. I mean, why wouldn't you want to do it that way? I can tell you this right now. I have not for a single moment, uh, one microsecond of regrets mm -hmm. for having done it that way because God does not disappoint. You want peace, be with God. You want peace, say the Hail Mary. Mm -hmm. You want peace, tell the Lord, I know you're present, I know you're here, and I know you love me. And then just say whatever psalm of thanks, whatever prayer of thanksgiving that you want. Uh, you know, and, and, and the peace will come. Just reflecting on God's loving presence, heavenly presence, sacred presence, good presence. As you're reflecting on these things, I'm telling you, you are then inside the mystery of God's goodness and love, and the peace that you will get is genuine. Not the peace of self-reliance, but the peace of God, you know, who, with whom I am connected and right. to whom I, I am dependent. Okay, very good. We're going to take a break here, give you a little chance for some peace and maybe uh, some water uh, <laughs> to get you ready for part two. I don't want to be accused of uh, drawing you out as I have in the past. Okay, well, stay with us. Father Spitzer back ahead answering more questions as we continue talking about contemplation here in the midst of Father Spitzer's universe. Stay with us. More ahead. And your questions collide with Father Spitzer's answers right here on Father Spitzer's Universe as we continue talking about contemplation with Father Spitzer. And uh, we were just talking about that. One of the things that uh, came off of that was the idea of centering prayer. And you were also yep. talking about transcendental and the idea. And I was thinking, is there a difference when we talk about someone emptying themselves versus quieting themselves? Is there a difference there? Yeah, there's there's two things. Let me just uh, quickly go to the centering prayer and then answer the second question. Uh, you know, with centering prayer, the main thing, if centering prayer is leading towards centering on the self, forget it. That, that kind of centering prayer is really, uh, in my view, uh, a kind of uh, an emptiness in, in, in many ways. Uh, and it's not going anywhere. But if the centering prayer is quieting oneself to center on God, mm -hmm. to center on His love, on His goodness, to center on His will, and to center on relationship with Him, then, yeah, you could say centering prayer in the sense of quieting myself to center on God is a good thing. Uh, to center on myself mm -hmm. is not a good thing. Right. I mean, in fact, it's 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 not prayer, and you might people deceive themselves and say, oh, if I center on myself, I, I, self, I can have much more self knowledge. Mm -hmm. I can assure you of this: uh, the least amount of self knowledge I get is from myself by myself. <laughs> When I'm by myself, I, I got to tell you, it, you know, it's not just the problem of all my hidden agendas, and they are many, all of my hidden ulterior motives, and they are many, but every distraction that can possibly come along on either an intellectual or emotional level, all kinds of things, when I'm by myself, there's just a host of things, you know, and of course, if I talk myself into thinking, gee whiz, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I'm in a state of real wisdom right now. Mm -hmm. I can tell you for all <laughs> intents and purposes, uh, you know, wisdom all by myself mm -hmm. is the greatest delusion that there ever was. Wisdom comes 
in relation to others. Of course we're self-conscious. Of course we have the capacity to reflect on things and freely deliberate on things. But we do it in relation to others. Human beings are not autonomous. This is the greatest myth that was ever devised since the, well, since the Protestant Reformation, really, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we can be completely autonomous individuals. Persons are interpersonal. Mm -hmm. We're born into the world interpersonal. If a mother just simply ignores her child, mm -hmm. the child will die. Period. Right. I mean, not because you, you could feed the child, put him on a machine, give him a bottle, right? But if the mother ignores the child, the, the child will die mm -hmm. for lack of affection, right. not a physical chemical, right? For all intents and purposes, what, what we're dealing with right. is a, 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 we even a, have, a, a necessity we of We even have a, a diagnosis today that you end up with some of those things. I think it's called RAD where you have, because of the way children were brought up, especially I know that's it's sometimes in uh, mm -hmm. Eastern Europe and other parts where, uh, where orphans and adoption mm -hmm. went through, that because the children mm -hmm. didn't have that nurturing, that there was actually a, a clinical affectation there, or the lack of ability to connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's right. that's exactly right. And of course, if they don't have uh, uh, the ability to connect or to empathize mm -hmm. with another human being, then uh, for all intents and purposes, too, they uh, uh, they can become quite sociopathic, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's problematic. Right. Or um, you know, they can just isolate. Uh, in any case, it, it's 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 not good. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you know, for you know, just getting back to the idea of quieting right. oneself. To center on God, great thing. Right. Uh, but if I'm just concentrating in some way to center on myself uh, as a center of my universe, instead of to center on God as the center of my universe, then that is going to lead to a whole lot of problems. It, and the whole lot of problems right. will come when all the, you know, the self-deception and all the self-aggrandizement that comes from these things, unbeknownst to me, Right. We need other people mm -hmm. to have wisdom. We need other people to experience love. We need other people to even experience the profound reality of ourselves. And without the interpersonal, we are not just one-tenth, we're one billionth of mm -hmm. ourselves. And so, of course, uh, again, you know, the idea of the autonomous self, we just got to, you know, put that one in the grave. Mm -hmm. It, it just never was true. It's led to all kinds of enlightenment deception, and and uh, it, it's so completely. Well, do you see false. that as a, a strong uh, connection between that approach and the whole idea of pride, right? Oh yeah, right. a absolutely. You know, and uh, like I said, you know, as something, you know, clicked. You know, and uh, it, you know, it was both scientific enlightenment, the Protestant Reformation, and of course, when you know you, you got uh, you know secular humanism, mm -hmm. and you know that that branched off from it. I mean, all of a sudden, right. that you know, the focus on on the person uh, by himself and for himself. I mean, you have these interruptions, you know, from great poets like John Donne, who are you know screaming, "No man is an island," right? Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, for all intents and purposes. Uh, you know, or Martin Buber, the great Jewish philosopher, mm -hmm. Gabriel Marcel, the great Catholic philosopher, who are screaming, but we've got to get our, our act together. And you got to remember, and, though, uh, that Simon you know, and Garfunkel in the 70s said, I'm a rock, I am an island. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what we're dealing with today. Let me ask yeah, you another. That was really <laughs> profound. Yeah. Well, the bridge over with John on troubled Dunn. water there. There you go. <laughs> Very popular in the 70s in most religion classes. Classes, as I recall. Uh, oh, but I was yeah. going to ask you is. Well, love means you never have to say you're sorry. <laughs> sorry, there you go. Love story. Yeah. What a wonderful movie. I'm okay, you're okay. Yeah. Except I'm more utterly, okay than you are. Profound. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little more okay than you now that we think about it. But That's is it right. also, and when you're dealing with this kind of transcendental meditation, this, the difference in the sense it seems like you get into the new agey thing when it's kind of like. You're emptying yourself so you realize ultimately you're either one with the universe or that there, if there is a God, actually you are God-like or actually you're God in some way, as opposed to the ability to connect to the distinct God, the Father. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you're right on the marker, and the mm. phrasing is perfect. You know, the idea of emptying yourself to be one with the universe, a more a kind of a Buddhist uh, approach, or you know, or emptying yourself to emerge uh, from uh, the universe as special, which would be called a stoic contemplation. Mm. Uh, both of those forms of contemplation are really the exact opposite of, of Christianity. Uh, our attempt is not to be either at the center or to be annihilated, right? Mm -hmm. The Stoic contemplation puts the self in the center. The, the Buddhist contemplation, you know, uh, wants to become one with the universe, to be, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a monism, right? But we, mm -hmm. we don't hold to either. We go right in between. But we want to be with God. God mm -hmm. created us, right, as, as interpersonal mm -hmm. agencies that we have our own self-consciousness, we have our own acts of freedom, and God does mm -hmm. not intend for us to annihilate those things, but rather to be in relation with Him and to be in relationship with others through love. That's the uh, objective of contemplation for the Christian. So the idea, again, of being one with the universe mm -hmm or the idea of being one as emerging out of the universe. Mm -hmm. in, in either case, uh, Christians uh, do not go there. Our objective is love. Our objective from the very beginning is not to be annihilated or to be special. It's to be in relationship mm -hmm. with God and others in the most profound, unitive way possible, but not in an absorbing way. Okay. Our objective is not to be, God doesn't want to absorb us. He wants to be in relationship with us in love and the same with other people. Right, right. Very good. Uh, next up, hello, Father. In your book, Finding True Happiness, you write that Ignatian mm -hmm. contemplation is a way of becoming personally familiar with the Lord and embarking on a friendship mm -hmm. with Him. How do busy working professionals mm -hmm. like this person embark on this path practically? This is uh, Leah from Georgia. So it sounds good. Yeah. You read the book. Uh, you say that's great, but yeah. uh, you know I'm living in the real world. How does that work? I'm, uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, the first thing is, is as I said before, don't get fancy. Uh, the first thing is to try and turn, um, you know, some psalms or common prayers like the Our Father or the Hail Mary into the vehicle uh, to begin your contemplative life. I would just say here is. Uh, uh, you know, uh, some possible ways of doing it for a, a busy person. So you're just starting to go to sleep and you take out your uh, rosary, let's say, and, uh, you know, Mary, I know you are here and I know you love me. Lord Jesus, I know you're here. I know you love me. Heavenly Father, I know you're here. I know you love me. And you begin to just prayerfully, you know, say the Hail Mary. That prayerful way of just you know, because it's a prayer of praise, right? Hail Mary, full of grace. You are full of, even though it's the words of, you know, Elizabeth, and you're still, you're giving her the same praise Elizabeth does. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. When we give praise, we are loving back, right? And, and you just say those words meaningfully, and then you can ask for the request, you know, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea is to ask for those prayers, uh, uh, to ask for uh, Mary's prayers. Well, you can do the same thing with the Our Father, which is mm -hmm. such a good contemplative prayer. You don't have to get fancy, but you start off the same way. Lord, I know you're here and I know you love me. Mm -hmm. And then you can start off, you know, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, holy, majestic, awesome, wonderful, mysterious, lovely is your name. Mm -hmm. And name for a Semite means essence. Your being, your essence is lovely, it's beautiful, it's majestic, it's good. And so you're acknowledging this. I mean, that in itself is, is a connecting prayer, a contemplative prayer. You don't have to get fancy, just sort of that acknowledgement. And then thy kingdom come. I mean, it, you know, 
It just you know, there you're making the request, Lord, you know, I want your kingdom to come to earth, mm -hmm. but I also want to get to your kingdom. Mm -hmm. In other words, just be unabashed. Lord, please help me to get into heaven mm -hmm. uh, with you <laughs> and to, into that heavenly relationship with you. And then, of course, you know my great spontaneous prayer. Thy will be done. Right. I always say thy loving will be done. Mm -hmm. I add the loving right to it. Thy loving will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then I say, you know, uh, give us a stay our daily bread. You know, help me get, I need some funds to get the Majus Institute going. Okay. I need, uh, you know, this thing, whatever it may be. I ask for my worldly needs, the cares and, and concerns that I have. there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's, there's nothing wrong right, with okay. that. We need help. And then finally, of course, I want to be liberated from evil. So, you know, well, forgive me for my trespasses. Put me not to the trial or to the test, but deliver me from evil and from the evil one. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, of course, the New Testament version of the prayer. We say, it, you know, forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But to just say that prayer slowly and contemplatively, mm -hmm. that's all you need to do. You don't have to get fancy, you know. I mean, you know, sometimes you're going to fall asleep just trying to say that prayer meaningfully right in the middle of it. But you're in relationship with God. You're connected to God. You're, you're there acknowledging the, the goodness and the majesty of God, which is going to rub off on you. Again, you can just, you know, uh, why not go through the Psalms or your Magnificat or whatever it may be and pick out just your 25 favorite Psalms, the ones that just speak to your heart mm -hmm. you know I mean I always love you know uh, the Lord is my shepherd there is nothing I shall want I, I mean I think it's a terrific mm -hmm. psalm if that's one of your take that one or Psalm 139 Lord you search me and you know me you know when I sit and when I stand you know my my uh, actions my words and, uh, from afar you know, even before the word is on my lips, Lord, you know it. And of course, you know, pick out those 20, 25 favorite psalms uh, that you have and just put them into a, a context, right, where you can just uh, like write them down. And mm -hmm. if there are some parts of the psalms that just are anachronistic, right, they, they're really kind of a, uh, they, they had a real relevance in the Old Testament. But, you know, Jesus has obviously superseded that in some way in, in the Sermon on the Mount, right? You know, so, uh, you know, some Psalms will have, you know, and I want to curse my enemies mm -hmm. and make their children grovel on the ground. Just take it out of there. I mean, you know well that that's not part of Jesus's uh, preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, right, where he tells us not to get angry, not to curse our neighbors and so forth. So just remove that stuff and just condense the psalm, you know, maybe uh, type it out and, and put it in a form, uh, you know, uh, or, or just take it right out of the Google version of the RSV, mm -hmm. right, and, and put it onto, uh, you know, a piece of paper, remove the things that are utterly inconsistent with the Lord uh, Jesus, and then just uh, you know, um, say those. It, once you got it down to about 25, you, you know, you, you can just pick, you know, th two or three and just mm -hmm. go through your little psalmody, you know, each time. And, and you don't have to get fancy. Right. You know, you just start off 15 minutes, maybe with a, a really well said our father and a very well said, you know, I always personalize all the Psalms as well, mm -hmm. right? So uh, if it doesn't, you know, um, I say instead of the Lord, right, which is, you know, uh, very typical for a Jewish person who, who, who right, you know, uh, the Lord is out there, right, third mm -hmm. person, right? I always, I've got Jesus who tells me, say, you, Lord, you, mm -hmm. Lord, you, Lord, are my shepherd. And therefore, there is nothing that I shall want. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the psalmist has some more the Lord's, but you can turn it into use. Or, and then the psalm continues, you know, even though I walk in the valley of death, I shall fear no evil because, and the psalmist shifts now, because you are at my side with mm -hmm. your rod and your staff to help me. So, you know, I would just, you know, try to personalize those psalms. Uh, as much as you can. I personalize the glory be as well in my contemplative prayer, you know, glory be to you, mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, and to you, Lord Jesus, and to you, Holy Spirit, right? Because, of course, you know, that again, 
when you're praising, you're, you're giving praise to God. Right. And it's all right for us as Christians to utilize, uh, you know, that very, right. very personal uh, touch with the Lord. But those are some ways okay. I would start. Always begin, though, with, Lord, I know you are here and I know you love me. Take those prayers of thanksgiving or praise the Psalms. Uh, take the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be. Just do something very slowly, deeply, mm -hmm. contemplatively, connecting with the Lord. It doesn't have to have a purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are prayers of petition. That's great. So if you want to say some prayers for certain things that you need, mm -hmm. then for uh, please go ahead and do it. Right. You know, um, uh, uh, do those things. But the contemplative prayer can just be to be mm -hmm. with God. That's all you need. I was going to say, do you think sometimes Lord we make it as you be with a friend? Do we make it? Yeah. So we sometimes we just make it more complex than it actually needs to be, right? Yeah. Exactly. I remember once, you know, my mom and my dad were sitting side by side on, on the bed, you know, uh, and uh, they were reading separate books, you know, and, uh, you know, I kind of zoomed into the room and I just said, gosh, you guys aren't talking to each other. You're not doing anything together. You're in your own thought world with these books, you know, and I said, what's the purpose of that? And my dad says, oh, reading a book with your mother makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I thought, that sort of says it because being with mm -hmm. her, or in this case, right. being with God, right. right, just being there with him, you know, you may be giving praise and so forth, but it's just that being mm -hmm. with that makes all the difference. It communicates, you know, his presence and his love mm -hmm. back, and it's going to transform us. It's going to transform us in peace because it's going to bring peace into our lives. It's going to transform us in his heart, his charity, because we are going to get it. Right. By, by giving praise, we are the ones that are transformed into his heart. Right. So, uh, in the being anyway, versus the, the doing easy and the kind of thing answer. that you were indicating. Exactly. Saying, right? In the being with. Well, let me ask you this other question. Did your mother and dad read similar books, or what would have been the difference between what he might have been reading and she might have been reading? Totally different. Okay. Uh, my mom liked uh, all kinds of relationship-type books, mm -hmm. and my dad liked war books and, uh, you know, <laughs> okay. uh, double, double, double agent spy books okay. and things like that. So <laughs> okay. it was a very different genre. And he liked history books, and mm -hmm. so, you know... Uh, so uh, very different books, but uh, our den was filled with them. And, you know, my mom had a very analytical side, too. Mm -hmm. She she was a, formerly a chemist, but mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to be honest, uh, you know, they had very different tastes in, in literature. So I think reading to each other might, might have been uh, probably beyond the pale, except okay. for, yeah. uh, you know, with theology or faith mm -hmm. or something like that. They might have enjoyed uh, okay. Uh, what each other was reading. Okay, here's, here's another question we got via email for your father. Father, it seems that a yep. big reason that atheism has become so widespread today is because many people have the wrong image of who God is. The viewpoint that wants to marginalize and rid the idea of God is one that doesn't view him in terms of perfect love, empathy, and desiring a relationship with me. So it's talking about why he believes that people have these is atheistic absolute. views. Go ahead. Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. I would say along the lines of why are there atheists, I would say that's number two in the list. Number one reason is suffering, which can't be accounted for, which seems almost absurd. And, of course, we as Christians, we have a huge, thick you know, a theology of suffering with all the opportunities, all the possibilities for offering up our suffering in conjunction with Jesus, all the purification we can get for our faith and love, all the opportunities for compassion to others. It's a huge theology of suffering because we believe in the resurrection. But, and so the, the, the main thing, you know, the, the problem with the suffering uh, reason for atheism is it feeds on itself, right? I'm an atheist because the suffering is inexplicable. Because, but because the suffering is inexplicable and I'm an atheist, I don't believe in the resurrection, which is necessary in order for me to have a Christian interpretation of suffering. So it's just, you know, right? It's a vicious circle, and I'm never going to be able to get out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to 
you know, break out of it and look for, you know, Jesus, the historical validation of his resurrection, right, by all the kinds of evidence that I can muster, the authenticity of the writing of the scriptures themselves, whatever. That's the first one, though, suffering. The second big reason is the one you mentioned. People have been brought up on an idea of God that has nothing to do with the father of the prodigal son, nothing to do with Abba, nothing to do with a God who actually loves me, cares about me, wants to be in relationship with me. So they grow up with a notion of God where God is either you know, indifferent to their salvation or they grow up even worse with the notion of God that I call the accuser. And the accuser is not God, mm -hmm. he is the evil spirit. Mm -hmm. So of course, if somebody keeps pounding into your head that God just wants to send you to hell, or God, you know, you, you, know, you, uh, you know, get into mm -hmm. you know, some of those uh, 18th uh, century uh, um, wonderful, um, you know, Jonathan Edwards type <laughs> sermons, you know, okay. God, Fire and brimstone. it just it holds you in mm -hmm. contempt mm -hmm. like some loathsome insect hanging from a thread over a flame. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody is telling you that this is what, how God views you, mm -hmm. then you're in trouble because there's no way, you're going to either have a mental breakdown or you're going to say eventually, hey, I know a lot of human agents who have a lot more wisdom and love than God. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you have the wrong notion of God. I mean, a loathsome insect, you know, that could only come, honestly, from the evil spirit. Mm -hmm. God holds you, I mean, he made you in his own image and likeness. He made you as beloved. It's the highest name uh, that can be given. John, uh, you know, the apostle, calls mm -hmm. himself the beloved disciple, right? And, of course, Jesus' own name for himself, right, right uh, uh, it is ha agapetos, the beloved one. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he adopted us, which makes us beloved ones. Mm -hmm. And we are free through our belovedness. So when we get right down to it, Right, God is uh, actually uh, loving us into, um, you know, the idea right. that we are beloved. However, if you were brought up with something really erroneous, mm -hmm. and believe me, a lot of people are, mm -hmm. a lot of people are brought up with a notion of God who I couldn't possibly recognize from the preaching of Jesus. You know, uh, if I were a genius, I couldn't see one scrap of it in there. But somehow, mm -hmm. this gets transmitted to a person. Mm -hmm. And I call those the six false notions of God. And I've got, you know, my new book, uh, you know, The Light Shines On in the Darkness, mm -hmm. chapter two uh, um, in that book is called Who God Is and Is Not. Right. And I go through these false notions of God, the angry God, mm -hmm. right, the loathsome or hateful God, right, the payback God. So, you know, something happens right. to you, got bad eyes. Oh, that's because when you were 30, you went ahead and did this action. And now God is the vengeful God. I'm the retributive God. I'm going to get even with you, you little wretch, mm -hmm. right? God, the stoic, you know, I'm so sick and tired of your whining. I can't believe it, Spitzer. Lo, these many years, and you still have right. not learned harder, faster, better, more. You know, you don't know me, and you're in for it. Quit your whining. Right. Or the disgusted God, the disgust God is another one. Oh, Spencer, you know, 64 years old, and just look at you, no progress. You don't look a day over you 30. Are That's simple. what you would say, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but you get the point. And I would, right. I would just say, you know, we got to go through those right. six notions of God. And what I do as I take a look at the preaching of Jesus relative to these six notions of God, and of course, you know, the hateful God, especially the, mm -hmm. that Jonathan Edwards, loathsome insect, you know, and, and, and the disgusting God, the stoic God, these things, angry God, they're all, 
you know, well, why would so I? deceptive, and yeah. they're all incommensurate. And why would a God, with the who, Father of the prodigal and, son? And why would a God who thinks of us that way want us to spend any time with Him, let alone eternity in heaven? That doesn't make very much sense. Does it? Exactly, so. exactly. <laughs> he certainly didn't need the revelation of Jesus to come to that fact. Right. I mean, let's face it: all kinds of primitive religions had that view of God all by themselves. Mm -hmm. They didn't need the fullness of revelation to come into the world to say that all of their, you know, unconscious archetypes of a horrifying God was, were actually true. Right. Jesus reveals just the opposite. God is the father of the prodigal son. God is the, uh, you know, is, is to be seen, the father is to be seen in Jesus, and Jesus in the father, right? right? He's the, the, the God who hanging on the cross is saying to the thief next to him this day, you will be with me in paradise. Right. He is the God who's telling the tax collector, you know, for just sitting in the back of the temple saying, have mercy on me for I'm a sinful man. I tell you that man right. went home justified. Take Jesus at his word, because to see Jesus is to see the Father, and you will know the love of the Father in the preaching and the actions of Jesus. And that's a perfect way to end this week's show. Uh, remember, you can always check out <laughs> Father Spitzer's website, magiscenter.com. And of course, we also have the uh, wonderful books that are available through our religious catalog as well. See you next time, Father Spitzer, when we will be once again talking about contemplation because there's so much that we didn't touch on yet. But uh, don't forget that uh, EWTN uh, is happy to present this program on a regular basis. You can check out EWTN.com and you'll find out all the information when the particular program's on. And don't forget Mother Angelica's latest work on suffering and burnout, a very popular book. And join us again next time as we re-enter Father Spitzer's universe, of course, next week at this time. And we'll be talking more about contemplation. So something to think about. See you then.